Hello, hello, and welcome to Awakening Aphrodite. I am your hostess, Amy Fournier. This show is all about inspiring you to be healthy, fit in mind, body, and spirit. Also to help balance your masculine and feminine energy, tap into your true source of power, your intuition, and awaken your authentic self. Today, I have a very special guest on the show for you. Her name is Dr. Christine Page. She is the epitome of a wise woman. She is courageous, she is intuitive, she's accomplished and she is powerful. I guess you could say she's like a modern day goddess. Christine has been a medical doctor since 1978, but she's known as a mystical physician. She's been a pioneer in, in the field of the holistic healthcare for over 40 years, working particularly with women. And she was actually raised amongst healers, mediums and esoteric teachers. She's an international speaker, and she speaks on subjects including embracing mystery, soul, centered health, and women's empowerment. Dr. Christage, Dr. Christine Page was gifted with intuition from birth, and she sees herself as a messenger of wisdom between the natural and spiritual worlds. She's the author of nine books, nine, <laughs> including her bestseller, Frontiers of Health, and her latest, The Heart of the Great Mother. Dr. Christine Page also has her own podcast called Heart Speak, which is wonderful. And she has a website where you can find all her online courses, books, events, all the ways that she can help you at christinepage.com. Dr. Page, welcome to Awakening Aphrodite. Wonderful to be with you and your audience, Amy. I just love the title of your podcast. So when you invited me to come on, it was like, yes, let's awaken Aphrodite. Oh my God. Thank you so much. Well, I have quite the story behind the name of that podcast and it really spoke to me. And honestly, I couldn't believe it was available. And I just thought that is a sign. I am, go I am jumping all over that name. So Thank you. And, you know, tell us what, what does the name Awakening Aphrodite mean to you? What does that conjure up for you? I like the word awakening, first of all, because it's really what's happening to us all at the moment. It's we've been slumbering, we've been sleeping. So even though we talk about new consciousness or something coming, we've got everything inside us already. And so I love the idea of something awakening. And I think we've all been awakening during this last year. And then the other side of it is Aphrodite. And Aphrodite really is the lover of life. And I think she often is put into being something about sex or beauty and all of those things are there. But when I really investigated Aphrodite, I thought, no, she says, do you love life? What do you love about life? And when I feel about awakening Aphrodite, it's awakening my love of life. And the life that lives within me, the, the parts of me that have been sleeping. So it feels like bringing everything alive to saying that's what it means to, to love life. It's to be awake, to be alive, to be in joy. And, you know, recently it's not always been easy to do that. But I think sometimes when we're in cocoons or lockdown, it makes us really clear about what doesn't work for us and what does. And I think that's been awakening inside us. Right on. I couldn't agree with that more. It's 100% on the money. And, uh, you know, it, it is interesting about the whole Aphrodite thing. And I think that that name even just goes into the, the struggle some of us have, that duality of the, the virgin whore complex. And, you know, the, I, think, I think there's just so much confusion about femininity and female power and is that an oxymoron you know and um that whole struggle we have with uh you know the the love hate and that's part of what this show is about uh, trying to harmonize and educate people on the balance and um how how those energies work together and how we all have all of that in us. We're, we're all of that and more all at the same time, right? Whether whatever our gender is or our identification. Oh, I, I so agree. And you know, my work has very much been like yours has to look at the Virgin Mother Crone, the yes. three aspects of the feminine, which as you say, exist within men and women. And 
I like to see that everything that is feminine really does run in threes. So three being the magic number, and the, the medicine of women. That's why women often wake at three o'clock in the morning. It's a, a very important time. But if we take it from really looking at the virgin energy as that which is our most creative, we could link it to the waxing moon. The part of us is like, yay, here we go, what excitement. And then we go to the mother energy, which is the nurturer of that energy, which actually is to do with the waning moon, which is how, what do I celebrate? What am I harvesting? And then that dark moon where there is no moon in the sky is that crone energy. And it's the time when we release, we let go, et cetera. And we, we do this every month. We do it every year. We're, you know, solstices or the beginning and endings of cycles. We do it with every breath. We breathe in, we breathe out we breathe new life in again. And why I hear you speak so eloquently about the fact that there is often some fear, some anxiety about power, it's because whatever happens, we have to follow this cycle. As human beings, we follow the cycle. As I say, it could be in our breath, it could be in following the moon, it could be in any, even our heart goes through these same cycles. And that we often have a fear not of the creative part, the virgin part, but of the dying part. And so we see that power of something to die, like winter, as something threatening us. Well, hang on a minute, I've just built all this up. How can you come along and just wipe it away? And that's what's been happening this year, that many of the expectations we may have had for 2020 or our plans or have been swept away. But this is the natural course of life or creativity which says we have to empty before we can fill again and it's that i think that that power to bring about death and transformation is one that as women we have it great difficulty because we're saying oh i don't want to harm anybody i don't want to upset people but sometimes we have to step into a true power that says i love you so much i will not let you continue on this path and often that's what our inner crone says to us when we get sick or when some disaster happens. It's not because we're bad people. It's more that actually this is not the path that nurtures our soul. It's not the path that nurtures us. And I love you so much. I'm going to help you to let go of that so some changes can take place. Brilliant. I love it. Uh, let's step back for our friends listening. Um, and can you explain to us uh, what the three phases of the feminine are, the, the virgin, mother, crone. So as I mentioned, the, the virgin is the creative side. So that's why I aligned it to this waxing moon. We see the light of the moon getting brighter and brighter and brighter. For, for women, it can be what we call the estrogen or the estrogen phase but it's there in all of us. So if you do start to want to follow these phases, then watch after the, the new moon and say, wow, this is my most creative time. Whether you're a man or a woman, it leads you up to that full moon. So often we feel inspired by new projects. In other words, you should never start a new project just before the new moon. It's not gonna have the right energy. It's also the intuitive energy of, of excitement. So Sometimes you get up in the morning, hopefully you do, and you go, wow, I'm gonna do this. So it's that new, fresh, innocent, wow, that's what I'm inspired to do. And then that second phase is the mother phase, which you know, in mythology, we often say we like the mother phase. So if someone said, what does it mean to be a woman, let's say, or the feminine energy, we often relate it to the mother energy. So it's almost the best known energy. So that mother energy is, what nurtures us, taking care of others. But it's more than that, because many a time, especially I will say amongst the women listeners, we're, we're much better at taking care of others than we are of ourselves. So mother energy is not just, oh, I need to love everybody and take care. It's, am I loving and taking care of myself? Yeah. So from the full moon, as we the moon waxes, uh, wanes and the light gets weaker, this is a time for us to say, am I nurturing myself? Or how do I nurture myself with my successes? And I think for many of us, we're really bad at celebrating ourselves. 
we're really bad at saying, yay, I did it, because someone says, well, that's, that's showing off. So feeding ourselves with our successes gives us the energy to go into the dark moon. And that dark moon is owned by the crone. And I know lots of people don't like that word, but the crone is the real word. It, you, you could use wise woman if you want, but she is the one that's saying, come into my other world rather than the underworld, come into my other world and let I will help you release those things that are no longer working for you. Or you may say, I'm just finished with this relationship. I'm finished with this job. You give it to her to take away. And it's when we're in that space of inner darkness, even though it sounds bad, it's actually the place of mystery and opportunities that we connect to the next birth that we want to give, the next seed that we want to bring into the world. So going through those three phases is important. And as I know, as a doctor, it's that third phase that we resist. You know, none of us want to let go of anything. We hold on, we hold on with our fingers. And yet illness will often say, look, I've suggested that you let go of this. But um, if you're not going to, then that's why we often experience physical illness because it stops us going down a path that is not healthy for us anymore. Okay, there's a lot I want to get into with that, but I just have to say, didn't you also personally have an experience just like that? I've had a few experiences like that, and we often call them dark nights of the soul. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to say that because yes, I've had breast cancer and yes, I've lost, you know, a lot of, I shouldn't say lost, but a lot of my family have passed over. In fact, I have more people over there than I do here. But they are times where we are literally stripped of what we thought our reality was going to be about. You know, we thought we were going to be in relationship with this person and all of a sudden they disappear. So it's that we're thrown into a dark night of the soul. But I think there's also times where we, you know, the real dark night of the soul is often when we have everything and we're dead inside. Huh. And I think that was my experience when I was working in, a, in England as a general practitioner. I had a lovely life. I had everything I wanted, but I was dead inside. And, and why was that? Because I, because I needed to let go. But I'm sure if any of you have been there, you can't make sense of it, you see. So what we naturally do is we think, oh, it must be a problem outside us. You know, how could it be anything wrong with me? So, you know, what I did was reorganize our clinic. You know, I thought, I'd, in, in other words, what does that mean that I'm dead inside? It meant I had no joy. I had, I'd lost the, the curiosity. I'd lost the excitement. We could call it depression, but I wasn't depressed. That's why often people, when they go to a doctor or someone, when they say, oh, I'm, I'm feeling I'm dead inside or depressed, they put on happy pills. But actually yeah. what I needed someone to say is, wow, lucky you, you're about to enter the dark moon of your soul or you're entering into the dark inner self. As someone mentioned it, you know, the word is actually that we get compressed. It's almost like nothing outside is working for us anymore. Now, did that mean I was, it wasn't working? It wasn't bringing me enjoyment. It wasn't bringing me excitement. It wasn't doing anything for me. So I'm not going to say my world had collapsed. I had everything, but I was dead inside. And I think that was really saying, Christine, this, you may think <laughs> you're on the path because when we go into general practice, it was like being in a marriage. So you do it for the rest of your life. Here I was, I was three years in and I was dead inside. And so my mind went, but hey, you're doing a good job. You're helping all these people. You're, you're doing what you're, you went for six years of study to do, you know, all your mental self tells you you're doing a great job. Spent all this money. Spent <laughs> yeah. all this money, yeah. you got all this training, mm -hmm. you know, look how many people you're helping. All the, all you the people need you. They yep. need you. And, and sounds so familiar. <laughs> and then your heart says, yeah, but I'm still dead inside, you know? Yep. And, and so some, if you say to someone, I see, that's why I use the word dead inside. I don't say, oh, I wasn't enjoying, because they say, well, of course you shouldn't be enjoying life. Life isn't about enjoying. That's your, oh, you <laughs> sounds like my, I've heard that before. Why I would you, why would you anybody to tell me what they felt, you know, or you're depressed. No, I wasn't depressed. So that's why if it helps us all, I use the word I'm, I'm dead inside because nobody can relate to it. So they don't try and put their beliefs on me. And so it really was one of those times where I went, I went to Finholm, which is a beautiful place in the north of Scotland, very magical place. 
had an experience uh, on one of Caroline Mace's courses. And all of a sudden I heard my inner voice said, leave. And it was like, I never had it in my mind to leave practice. That was the last thing I thought I needed to do. But that was exactly what my soul needed me to do. How um, long How long since you heard that voice till you actually did? Was there like years or was no, it? No, it was days. So then days. I, I was there nice. for a week. And so I spent the whole week. I don't Planning. think I finally finished the workshop with Caroline. And, you know, I spent the week working out because that's what our mind does. Well, I'll do this and I'll do that and mm -hmm. I'll sell my house. And I had no idea what I was going to do because, again, that's what we want is to say, well, I'll leave when, you know, when I have another job. That wasn't my mechanism. It was more like, well, how am I going to sell my house? You know, all those things. And I went left in uh, Inverness. I left uh, the airport went back to my beautiful little home and I thought to myself what are you crazy you went to this place where they're all magical yeah and you're going to give up everything you have you know back and to I reality think, what was I so thinking I remember thinking yeah. I'll just go back to work nobody knows and I'll just pretend it never happened oh. and the way my past lives always come to me they came to me instantly and so the past life came and I heard the words, so you haven't got the courage to do it. Once again, you haven't got the courage to do it. And it was like that. Ouch. You know, Ouch. Don't you ask me. <laughs> yeah. So I went into work and I, I spoke to my beautiful partners, my male partners, they were. I only say that because I was very, I've always been supported by men as well as women, but men have always been on my side for these things. And I said, you know, I need to leave. And they said, well, of course, we always knew you would. How can we help you? And it was like, that isn't the response I was waiting for. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so then I went out to my receptionist and uh, I said, hey, I'm leaving. Could you, you know, block the book off for the next three months after the next three months? And they said, fine. Oh, you've got a car. I'll buy it from you. And it was like, okay. And then I went to the, the estate agents, the realtors, and I said, hey, I've got a house. And he said, oh, my brother will buy it. Oh, so my I God. Time, I know, had no house, no job. And no <laughs> car. <laughs> so you always know when something's right. And when the, the actual day I left was actually the harmonic convergence, if any of you know about that, in 1987. And that was actually when a whole portal opened, a doorway opened into a new consciousness. But I didn't know about this when I made the decision to leave. Wow. So that's what I want to put across is that's all intuition. So as I said, when the crone says to us, I won't let you be left, I love you so much, I won't be let you be less than you are. It may feel as if everything's being stripped away from you. But actually, when that happens, a new world is waiting. That's the dark night of the soul. The, it, the new piece of you is waiting to be embodied, but we have to let go first. Okay, but how did you have the courage to do it, Christine? Um, I couldn't bear the dead inside anymore. <laughs> okay, so you got to the point where the pain was too much to stay. Yeah, and that was only a few months, you know, and I, I have to say that was easier. I'll also say that I've been divorced and... Um, that was a time where I believed all you had to do in a marriage was make someone happy. And, you know, when it, they weren't happy, and some of you may relate to this, it must be my problem. Mm -hmm. So if I could just change myself or change the circumstances, they'd be happy. Yeah, let's work on it. <laughs> let's work on it, you know. And it's like, I, you know, it was my naivety, and it was a naivety that I believe that in a marriage you make people happy. And, you know, mm -hmm. my my lovely husband now of many years said, "You can't make me happy, and you can't make me unhappy." And it was like, "Wow, that's a revelation." <laughs> Keeper. <laughs> so I think that sometimes we dig ourselves in, and I would say to all of us our intuition knows that it's not working. That's why I use the word dead inside. Mm -hmm. um, I developed breast cancer several years ago and everybody, you know, I even wrote in my own books, it was mm -hmm. about loving yourself. But when I developed the breast cancer, I realized it wasn't that I wasn't doing things that were loving to myself, like having a massage, et cetera. It was that I'd lost the self that needed loving. And I think that that's something that I would say to all of us, especially if you've ever had cancer, is we lose ourselves in trying to make other people happy or trying to do a good job or being responsible. 
it, both men and women, we all have that difficulty. You know, we, we we've been told this is our responsibility. It's our sacrifice, it's our service. All of that allows us or makes us believe that it's not okay to do the Aphrodite thing that says, am I loving life? Does, am I in love with my life? And am I in my life or have I lost myself? That was a huge revelation. Yes. So how, how would you say someone is to, would start to get there, to, to start to find the self that needs the loving? To, they don't even know who they are. They're so lost in their identity of being the mother, the wife, the employee, the daughter, the whatever. You know, they just don't even know who they are. How do they find who they are to find the self to love? I think... Amy, you know, the very question you ask is the right question to say, <laughs> are, you do are you lost? I mean, the very fact that you might even consider you're lost, that's a starting point. Because most times someone will, um, you know, say to me, won't even ask, you know, will say, I've got a great life. And so I say, okay, so what do you do for pleasure and fun? And they go, oh, what do you mean pleasure and fun? <laughs> So they're just simple questions like, do you actually, are, are you working so hard that you never have fun or pleasure? Mm -hmm. Do you even know what they are? Um, again, I don't, I have to be very careful when I say things like, do you nurture yourself? Because I know there are people listening who will go for a massage or do something, but they're still in their heads. And I can do that. I can Absolutely. be lying on that massage table and I'm thinking. All it is is an item to check off your yeah, list. That's check off list. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, got the massage. massage. <laughs> Next, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. laying in bath. <laughs> that, yep, that's you know, it. And, and then uh, the other thing I can do is I will go for a massage and end up taking care of the person who's massaging me. Oh my me. god! Story of my life. Yes. Yeah. You know, and it's like actually, did that nurture me? So, some sometimes just asking that question: Was I? was I being nurtured? Because as I say, one of the hardest things is us, for us to receive. Often it's yes. about giving. Mm -hmm. So the very fact I receive is the I exists, you know? Um, and so I'm not, you know, a lot of the energy that if your listeners know about the, the chakras, this is the, the solar plexus chakra. You know, it's so much about, do I please people? And 85% of people who develop cancer are nice people. You know, we please other people. We don't want to cause upset. But that pleasing of others is the way of losing ourselves. And so where are we and why do we do it? Because maybe we're fear of the repercussions if we don't. So many a time, you know, we will experience the re repercussions and we'll end up saying, actually, it wasn't worth it. So at the solar plexus, the when we know we are strong inside ourselves, we say, I feel okay. And I'm not affected by your criticism or your or your approval. That's the power of the solar plexus. And that's the area of the body that's leaking so much power for so many women. Yeah. And but but how do they even begin to develop that? Because I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Until you're strong in your own core, you can't withstand the uh, criticism coming at you or, or risking somebody not approving of your decisions you, it right. just hurts too much so then exactly. you don't you don't do those things that you really want to do that's right so it's it's going to be small steps and i think you know if, every time you say how do we do it is that recognition i'm doing it is the first step okay it's like, oh my god i'm a pleaser <laughs> yeah. oh my god i'm not actually very happy in this situation mm -hmm. and you know the solar plexus i describe is like being a big satellite dish mm -hmm. And the more dysfunctional your family, and I will say my family wasn't dysfunctional, I was just always intuitive. Mm -hmm. So uh, that more dysfunctional your family, in, in other words, where there's anger, abuse, uh, addiction, etc. of course, what you're going to do is use your satellite dish to read everybody in order to stay safe. And that becomes a habit so that I, as an intuitive I'm, I said to myself, wow, I can read anybody and create the world for them that makes them happy. So because I could do that. But many, many women and men do this, which is hang on a minute. I'm not just making them happy. I'm making them happy so that I won't get hurt. 
Yeah, so it's just codependence. It's a codependence, but it's actually a, a reasonable, it's a survival mechanism. So if mm. the anger was so big or the overwhelming emotions, because often at the solar plexus, we're, we're like a vacuum cleaner to other people's really heavy dose emotions. We're like, wow, if I can just vacuum clean up your emotions, then phew, everything will be easier. So many a time we use that solar plexus as a means of staying safe. And so what I say to all of us is, first of all, just recognize how psychic you are because the solar plexus is our psychic center. So when we recognize that, yes, I'm reading people every minute of my day. Yes, I do know people that know about things about the people I'm working with. That's a first step to recognizing, wow, I'm really psychic, but not use that as a, woo, look how psychic I am. It's saying, just because you can pick up on energy, it doesn't mean that you then need to immediately react to that energy, because that's what's happening. You know, I, I, I meet someone who's uncomfortable or unhappy, I vacuum clean their energy, and then I fix them. So where in our lives are we picking up on energy and trying to fix people? Because if we can fix them or rescue them, then we can feel better about ourselves. So the ability to just even recognize, wow, I am picking up on energy is a first start. And then intuition, which is different from being psychic, that says, what is the wisest and most loving thing I can do in this moment? And sometimes it's to say something. Sometimes it's by keeping quiet. Or sometimes it's by asking a question. Uh, I might say to someone, I sense you're not very happy. Am I right? They may say, I'm fine. Well, just back off and, you know, stop trying to fix them. So sometimes we just have to separate away from everybody and not take everything so personally so we can be more objective and then make better decisions. Yes, I think the, the, the ch I, I love everything you just said. I think the challenge is with people trying to walk that fine line of loving others intensely and wisely and completely as well as themselves simultaneously. Like how do we walk that road of doing the wise and loving thing for you, but also the wise and loving thing for me and sometimes feeling like they might be in conflict? And, and I would say this might sound very odd, but actually the only person you can help is you. And I think that when I live an authentic life, when I live a life that nurtures me and takes care of me, I can be more giving to other people because it, otherwise it becomes so conditional. In other words, I'm saying, um, well, I'll do this for you, but this is what I have an expectation of that you will give me in return. So even if we can just understand that real unconditional loving is not giving with conditions. So if I say, you know, I have an expectation of, uh, attached to my giving, I shouldn't give. So the only way we should give is when it truly is without expectations of a result or without expectations of something happening. And it's those damn expectations that get us. Plus, I, what I've realized, too, is when you're giving with that idea, even if it's subconscious, it's actually the most selfish thing you can do because Absolutely. you're really giving in order to get your own security. Absolutely. You're, you're Absolutely. giving. Yeah. Like, and I'm going to say that again for the people listening, because this is a thing I had to hear. You know, we, we think I'm being so altruistic and I'm being so unselfish and I'll do this for you, kind of sacrificing myself or whatever because I love you but it's truly being selfish because what you're really doing is you're trying to secure that person's good feeling for you so it's out of your own security insecurity that you're trying to get some security by martyring and sacrificing yourself for someone else under the guise of you're doing it for them Perfect. Perfectly said, Amy. Absolutely. Well, I've lived it. <laughs> I, I, right. We learn these lessons the hard way and I'm, and I'm secure enough not to be ashamed of it because honestly, I think it's very common, unfortunately, and people don't even know they're doing it. So there's exactly. one for, there's yeah. one for those of us who feel like they're being selfish but it's like, well, you guess what? You're being more selfish than you think you are already out of, you know, what I just said, when, you, yeah. when, you, when you're really sacrificing, but you're really doing it for your own selfish security reasons. 
So true, so true. And I often use the word manipulation and I can see people's eyes like, oh, I'm not manipulative. And it's like, well, you actually are. You're mm -hmm. already projecting onto someone else what you expect them to do. So that's manipulation. It's a barter. You're you're actually yeah. subconsciously bartering. Like I'm going to do this for you, a tit for tat, because I'm securing something from you by me giving this to yeah. you. And, and I think and, when I use the word manipulation, it it, it is a, a subliminal. It's not that you don't know what you're doing. Mm. It's more like I'm going to do this. And I think when we talked about women's empowerment, this unfortunately is much more common in women than men. So I think that when women became disempowered, we could say mm -hmm. that in, that empowerment went inside. So women more commonly than men will become empowered by unfortunately manipulating other people's emotions. Okay, and so can you get into that a little bit for us to understand how that happened and then how we can get out of that? And, and I also was gonna ask you, could you give us a brief synopsis of the history of women that, you know, obviously people that are alive in this generation really don't, we're living in a patriarchal culture and society, but it certainly has not always been that way. And can you just give us somewhat of a brief synopsis of how there's been cycles and where we're at and how that all plays out? Yes, exactly. Love to. And I used the figure about 3,500 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I've studied many civilizations and it's not always just 3,500. It could be, it could be uh, 3,000 years ago. You know, it's around that period of time that in mythology, you start to see the rise of the patriarchy and the suppression of the feminine. And prior to that, and I always want to make sure everybody knows this, we lived in very egal egalitarian societies, which meant that male and female were equals. So sometimes people talk about a matriarchal society. We had matriarchal societies in that, but much more commonly was egalitarian. And really, if you go even further back, I mean, we could go 8,000 years back, people liked to see us as you know, barbarians, et cetera, but we weren't. We were much more in tune with nature. And this is really what happened was that, you know, 8,000 years ago, we would build our, our villages within the, within nature we were more in tune with the earth and the plants and the birds and what happened when this patriarchal influence came in we saw our separation from our connection to mother earth and we developed a sky god a Yehovah, Yahweh, the god in the sky and it was really that change that made us disconnect from mother earth and all that she offers which is also the creative energy. And we then created much more hierarchies, uh, the idea that you have to climb the mountain in order to get somewhere and you can't get there otherwise. So it was a period of time where we, I think more importantly, we didn't only get disconnected from Mother Earth, we also got disconnected from these cycles that I was talking about earlier. And so there was this desire to create something and have it so that basically no crone would come along and knock it down. And so what we've been seeing in this last year, and it's really not completed, is organizations that have set themselves up as the prime uh, examples of expertise. And I think it's gone across the board, whether it's education, medicine, law, we're starting in politicians, we're starting to say as, wow, we thought those people knew what they were doing. They haven't got a clue. And so the breakdown of those structures is very important at this time. So we start to develop more community-minded structures, but structures that relate once again to us, us and our earth. So we, we, we recognize things much more on an earthly level. I hope that helps describe that. Yes. Can you tell us though what, what happened? If most cultures through you know, thousands of years ago, as human beings, we evolved more egalitarian, what do you know what the big reason was all of a sudden it the it went to patriarchal no that you know there's it, it's not and what what would people say there's an invasion of the indo-european people into different cultures mm -hmm. but you know my understanding that's why i think it was over a period of time it really was like not a one-time invasion it was an incursion of different these different belief systems and i i you know 
I suppose I could look back at the astrology to say what was going on. I haven't got astrology for that long back, but it feels like something we had to experience. And now we're having that time to get back into more in the egalitarian societies. Yeah, it's like the pendulum is swinging back yes. now to yes. help so I, bring some know, balance. I, I want to see the, the empowerment of the feminine, I'll say, in men and women. And that's only yeah. that the two can walk together. I don't want to see, you know, what, as you know, you've heard me say this, we have a lot of mini men amongst women. Yeah. So, you know, I've watched women become yeah, this is it, to be a woman, it's to be powerful, masculine, intellectual. That's not feminine. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's just like becoming a mini man. We have so many of them out there mm -hmm. who are purporting to be the role model for all women. And, and so, the, the, you know, that balance can be found within a man or a woman that we need to find that balance between intuition and intellect, between our, our qualities of nurturing and our, quality, our doing and our being. So it's finding that balance I'd love to see. So what would you say it means to be a woman, Christine? I feel that intuition is high on the list. And I'll say that because I think it's found within that inner knowing that being able to literally live the life of this three parts of the feminine. And so it is to be inspired, to be connected, to nurture and release, that it is to be a woman. And so for a woman, she has these deep connections to creative power, and that exists within the earth. I call that dragon energy. She has the power to bring about change when it's necessary. And I, I'm not seeing that in some of the, there's a tribe down in South America who keeps saying to the women of North America, why aren't you telling your men to stop? Uh, yeah. You know, and I feel that every time the, the true feminine has stepped forward in the form of a woman, it's been, she's the one that has the bigger vision that says, what you are doing is destroying us. Mm -hmm. Or, and I always say, is what we're doing helping the next seven generations? Or is it just serving your own little ego? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the power of women to have that bigger vision and to be able to say this, we are not doing this. And this is why women were often cho chosen as what they called the grandmothers because only women knew what it was like to bear a baby to their chest and then have to bury it. So it was only women that decided if we should go to war. It was only women who knew what was worth fighting for. And that's the role that I would like to see women stepping up for, not just to say stop, but to say, stop, this is not good for all of us. This is only good for the few. Mm -hmm. And we have far too much of that going on at the moment where we're being told it's going to serve the full, you know, to everyone. And truly it's only serving very few people. Well, that's the great hoodwink going on right now, which is a whole nother story, but you and I are in agreement about that. I mean, it's, it's. Yeah, and I, and I want to say, Amy, if, sorry, just to complete on that, you know, if mm. a woman follow, every woman has periods, you know, I, mm -hmm. I realized that the one thing every woman does, she has periods for almost 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so, if women understood that when she has her period, that is the time when she's letting go, her ability to die to the outer world and really reconnect to the inner world, her inner world, and then be born with a new idea after the period. If, if every woman recognized her ability to die to the old and to die to the outer world, she would be in her power because the biggest threat that anybody puts upon us at the moment is you're going to die, especially mm -hmm. around COVID. So if mm -hmm. I said, well, hang on a minute, I do, the, do that every month. What's mm -hmm. the big deal? Mm -hmm. So the more that, you know, that's why I, I had my dark night to the soul wasn't. So I, di I died to the outer world so I could connect to my inner world. Mm -hmm. And once I connected to that, it was like, why would I carry on something that isn't nurturing me? So you know, what it is to be a woman is to recognize that your dying process, your ability to die to the outer world is your power. And that's why the women could step forward and say, stop doing that. Not because they were, oh, I'm so angry. It's like, actually, I'm not threatened by your fear anymore. I'm not reacting to your fear. I'm reacting 
or acting from a place of what is nurturing for the future. And if it means we have to die to something to have a new future, let's go for it. I love that. And some of uh, the most uh, impactful material from your work that I've got from my studies of you is uh, I've never heard someone explain before a bigger concept, a bigger reason for the whole reason for menstruation and having babies and, and the whole mothering thing. And you were the first person that got me to think about periods and sex and pregnancy and how it's so sad that in our culture, it's been so tied up with shame and guilt and fear and judgment and embarrassment. You know, periods were considered to be the curse of God from the Garden of Eden, you know, and, and, have, and that we're gonna have painful childbirth as, as punishment for the downfall of man. I mean, Jesus, it, well, <laughs> I, should, I should say Jesus, but <laughs> kind of ironic, but you know, it's just this whole concept that we have culturally of the shame and judgment about our sexuality and our sexuality being the root to evil and the devil and, you know, to sin and, yeah. and, and, you, and you talking about how periods are this, the, the gift to our intuition, it's the gateway to our intuition and how you explain how the cycles of the moon, like you have been in this show, uh, coincide with our natural feminine cycles every month of the new, the blossoming and then the death. Every month we go through these cycles and that's how our periods are symbolic of that. And you talk about how that continues even after menopause, that even for women who've gone through menopause, they still go through these symbolic and physiological, well, maybe not, maybe not physical, because that's physical, right? But so symbolically they go through these cycles, right? You talk to us about all that. I just threw a lot at you, but <laughs> but <laughs> well, you. I love yeah. what you're saying, and, and it, I, you know, it, there are so many women, unfortunately, who are being told you don't need a period just because right. you're not going to have children. You're not. You don't need a womb. I mean, I've had women tell me I've had my womb removed just because I didn't want to. You know, baby. didn't don't need it. Yeah, and. You know, 20% of 40 year olds will not have children. So the thing that we don't have in common is having babies. Mm -hmm. But what we do have is we give birth every month. And that would be so wonderful if we were told it's, yes, you can give birth to a baby, but mm -hmm. you can give birth to a new project, a new podcast, a new idea. Every month we are born, for instance, we are born with, I think, a million eggs. And, you know, by the time we get to puberty, it's about 200,000. But 200,000 ideas are inside us as women. And, you know, you've got, that's the, you know, one, one a month, is, you're not going to run out. So I always worry when people, doctors are telling you, oh, you've only got, you know, 10% yeah. of your eggs left. Well, 10% of 200,000 is a lot of eggs. Yeah. You know, it, but it, it's, again, it's how, um, it's things, education or medicine are twisting the truth. And so once we start menstruating, as you said, every month we let go, we empty our womb, we empty ourselves of old ideas, we then connect to the truth, we connect to the, the richness, what I call the ocean of possibilities, and our eggs, and when we give birth to a new idea. And then once 40 years or whatever has gone by, we really should know how to die every month. But of course, when we don't know that. Yeah. So let's imagine that every month for 40 years you've died and you bought, gave birth to something new, then once you get to the menopause, you don't need to keep doing it physically because it's inherent in you to do this. But that's how it was supposed to be. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. But that's exactly. So, what, you know, I now I'm postmenopausal every what I do on the dark moon. So it's a three day ritual, whether it's the first three days of your period or three days of the dark moon, which is the day before the new moon, the day of the new moon and the day after. And so on the day before the new moon, the first day of the dark moon, I will take a glass of water and I will put my hands around it. Here we go. And I will infuse into that water everything I'm ready to let go of. And then I pour it onto Mother Earth and I say, take and transform this so I am empty. And then on the second day, and this could be the second day of your period or the second day of the dark moon, I allow myself to root into Mother Earth. I nurture myself. And on the third day, I meditate with the idea of drawing up from Mother Earth a new idea that I'm going to give birth to. 
So we can, we all can do that. I mean, men do it as well if they want, but women are, we, we are the vehicles or the vessels for birth transformation. So it's much more natural for our bodies to do that. I love that. So for example, tomorrow happens to be a full moon. Yes. That's so that it's so then the full well, moon is is the opposite of that. So I'm not I know a lot of for instance, women and men will say, Yay, full moon. But yeah. actually, if you think of the light of the moon being the masculine and the dark of the moon being the feminine, the full moon is almost the uh, epitome or the, the joyful celebration of our masculine. So the full moon is our time for saying, look what I've succeeded at, look what I've done, yay, look at me. And then the week after the full moon is the time when we really do need to network. This is the fertilization of our dreams. So we share with the world what we've done on the full moon. And then we want to tell everybody about it so that it, it grows. So this is when to get yourself into social media and it's yay, look what I've done. <laughs> and then the week before the new moon, you quieten down and you, you're, that's not a good time for socializing or putting your new ideas out. See, this is such a beautiful message and one that is so desperately needed because I feel like the narrative is always about, you know, just get it out there, put it out there, get, be productive, be, you know, contribute, be of service. And now, of course, with social media, like if you did, if it's not on social media, it didn't happen, right? I mean, people are videotaping everything and putting it out there. Uh, how can we as a culture and particularly as people trying to be more in our feminine energy, uh, kind of give ourselves permission to go into the dark, into the inside, into the step back, into the introspection and not feel like we have to always kind of be out there and shining our light. I love your example of the light of the moon is the masculine, you know, cause you know, culturally we're, we're not encouraged to go within and pull back and you know people hate winter for example because it but winter is the season when we're supposed to introspect and go to bed early and you know stay by the fire and not be out in the sunshine long down the beach you know so how can we shift that culturally by starting with ourselves well i would say go within? thank you thank you amy i think you know the moon is a great example and i follow it Fortunately, where we live here in New Mexico, we have very light nights. I mean, in terms of we don't have many clouds. So it's easy for me to watch the moon and go, oh, look where it is. And, but even if you do have a cloudy night or you're not able to see the moon, just get the app and just get the app and watch the moon cycle. Now you can also get it. So that would be what I would say generally. If you want to, so first of all, get used to saying, okay, it's a new moon. I've got some new ideas. These next 14 days or 11 days, I, I'm going to express. And then ding, here's the full moon. What am I sharing with the world? Okay. And then the next week after that, wow, I'm going to get out on social media. But the week before the new moon, quieten down. So even if you just get used to that cycle, if you're also having periods, then start to use that same it just happens to be 28, 29 cycle, day cycle. So do the same, you know, with your period, it's a quiet time, just as you come to the end of your period, it's an inspirational time. And then you lead up to ovulation and many women know when they're ovulating. That's obviously, we call it a very fertile time if you want to get pregnant, but you can understand it's also a very fertile time if you want to share your ideas, that's what fertility is. And then again, just before your period, and this is why so many women have PMS, is quieten up, you know, tell everybody, I'm actually not going to start a new project. This is why women get so ratty before their period, because they need space to reflect, go quiet, you know, say to your family, hey, I'm not taking care of you so much in this week, you need to take care of me. And once we start to shift the energy, I tell you, your family will shift with you. I've got many women who are actually telling their husbands or their children, I'm not going to cook for you during the first few days of my period. Because that really, when you are clearing the energy for your family, it's not a great time to be making food because all they're going to do is start to eat the food with all those old energies that they wanted you to get rid of. So in no indigenous tribe would the men or the children eat from a, a woman who is 
is, is in those first three days of her period. And I think that got misconstrued by people thinking it was because it was dirty or yucky or whatever, but yeah. in, in actuality, in ancient cultures, the priests were known to actually drink uh, menstrual blood because yeah. it was considered to be a pathway to the divine and have special healing powers. So it, it got twisted a little bit yeah. as to why women weren't allowed to cook and prepare meals for the family, not because the it was it was the opposite. It wasn't because it was dirty. To your point, it was because they respected the part that the fact that the feminine was thought to be the ones that cleared the energy from the family, from herself, from the culture. So it was a time when she needed to do her own internal cleansing. So it was more of a respect, really, for her well, needs. For her a, needs. A little bit more, Amy, that, she, that, that the men couldn't clear. That's the fact. You see, the women are the clearest mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of our period. So the men were like, oh, please, please, yeah. keep this clearing for me. Yeah, we're in and trouble that, if you don't do it. <laughs> you know, because I yeah. can't do it. Or I right. can't do yeah. it. You know? yeah. And then the second day is a day when the women connect to the deep power of creation. I mean, this is, you know, whatever. And I'm trying to think it's not necessarily a Kali energy, but it's the deep power of creation. And this, this was like a Shakti energy. So that in many indigenous groups, they would say, please don't come anywhere near anything sacred in our life because you will literally break it with your power. Well, so I know my friends, Native American, it would be, you know, don't hold the, don't, you know, hold the chinupa, the pipe, you'll break mm. it. Don't go anywhere. Wow. Wow. So they were saying you're too powerful at this time. So the first day is when you're cleansing, but the second day is stay away from anything. And they would say, don't even, you know, don't have sex with a man on that day because you literally, if I may say, will deball him, the craft trades him. But that's how they all want to go, I think. They just how they all want to die. And <laughs> yeah, but they do don't. It. You know, that's what, the, you know, I think at the very beginning you talked about, the, you know, the fear of women. Hmm. Men's greatest fear is that they will be with, taken back into the womb and die. And so that was the act of sex, which was, if you want, because sex for a woman, she is the sexual energy. What is sex? It's the reunification. So birth is the going from unity into duality, and sex is going from duality into unity. Wow, so yes. A woman, a man would enter a woman, and again, I know I'm just using the stereotype of a man and a woman at the moment, but a man would enter a woman because that was the way he could reunify, reunify with himself. And that's the sexual act where he would surrender to the woman and she would take him up her serpentine ladder and have an orgasm and he would be carried to be in unity with himself, in bliss with himself. And then she would give birth to him after the sexual act. But you see sex got turned completely around where a man sets the rhythm of sex. He decides how the rhythm is gonna go. Whereas what he should do is surrender and allow himself to experience being energetically pulled through her at that time. Isn't that amazing? I love that description. I've never heard it described that way. You know, it's, it's amazing how we've gone so off track. Exactly, I don't know what happened exactly. to us. You know, oh and if you asked about the, you know, men understood this. And again, it isn't just about having physical sex, that mm -hmm. a woman's is a magnetic energy. So in mm -hmm. the presence of a woman, a man will often feel more inspired. We often oh, yeah. talk about, you know, a, a man writer will often say, this is my, muse. You know, I need a woman and, in my life in order to be inspired. Yes, it's their muse. In the muse, thank you. I was thinking of the mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. But the fact was that around that same time of 30, you know, 3,000 years ago, and, and increasingly, men then separated their women. They, they, they didn't like the idea that they needed a woman in order to experience their unification. That was one of the other issues. And so they divided their women into whores or mothers. And so that was where the, you see in the, for instance, the Greeks, uh, the mother figure would have you know, almost be dressed with a high neck and, you know, yep. showing nothing, but the whore would have, you know, breast showing. Mm -hmm. And that was really, they said, we will, you know, our mothers, the mother energy of our children, etc., will are not defiled. They're pure. This is where mother Mary came from. Mm -hmm. But the whore, we, you know, we're just using her to get what we want. 
which was really, you know, one of the roles where Aphrodite got seen as the whore to be used rather than to actually be seen as something that a man needs, you know, that surrendering to that feminine in order to achieve all that he wanted to achieve. Wow. Yeah. Well, so how would you describe then the, the feminine archetype? Like, do you have words for that? Like what would be an, I, the, the ultimate f female archetype? I probably have covered it in various ways, you know, and I think that's why I tried to try to define it out as the Virgin Mother Crone. Um, okay. I think it is because more, we're more comfortable with that virginal quality. And, you know, there are men who just want to marry a virgin because it's again, something that's not defiled or, you know, mm -hmm. I just want that free energy. Um, and vir I just want to say for everybody, the true meaning of the word virgin is to be complete unto yourself without the need for another to make you whole. So all of us are virgins in that sense. We have within us our per perfect state. So if you want to understand your own inner virgin, it's the part of you that, that resonates with your heart to start some new project. So that might sound strange, but it's like, where do we get intuition from? Isn't it true that some of our greatest insights come out of the blue, like I was telling you with my stories? Mm -hmm. And that's that virgin in you. That suddenly you wake up to something, you say, wow, I'm going to do this. And you think, where did that come from? <laughs> so mm -hmm. the true meaning of the virgin is that, that clear, without the need for someone else to make it happen for you. I think the mother energy, as I say, is often the part that we will say is about the cake, taking care of people. But the true mother was the heart of the home, the hearth, you know, the idea that it is her that sets the rhythm to something that's going to happen. And we've lost that. Mm -hmm. You know, women are now trying to be mini men when I have no problem with us all as women working, but a woman's place is also to set the rhythm, the ritual for the family. Mm -hmm. And to define, no, we're not doing that this month. We're doing something else. That's what women did at the end of their period. They would come out with this new inspiration and say, okay, guys, this is what we're going to do. And the men in, in the stereotypical way would say, fine, now we know what we're off to do. But the women really were the ones that watched to see, is this really following that rhythm? And then that crone equality, as I say, sometimes having that courage as a woman to say, stop, this isn't working. And you know, really, that's, I think, the hardest energy, because we want to be liked. Mm -hmm. And I know, as a, you know, in all my work, sometimes I've had to say to someone, that isn't the most loving thing you're doing for yourself. And to be seen in that way, I mean, I'm now moving that crone energy, I hope this is fine with, with our listeners, is having that crone energy is having the eyes to see what is going on. And I know that a lot of the, those listening will see things and sometimes not have the courage to follow through. Mm -hmm. I know that the hardest things I've ever done as a woman is saying, I see what's happening here. This isn't working. Isn't that true? And I know because I've often, not often, but when I've done this, especially around acquaintances, they haven't liked the fact that I see what's happening. And so what we need in our society today is more women who are saying, I see what's happening. That isn't a judgment call. It's not saying you're wrong, but so much is happening underneath the, 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 the vision, you know, so much corruption, so many awful things are happening on our planet and they're being done because they think they can't be seen. And I feel that with the role of women today is to bring to the light, into the light, what is happening in the darkness without judgment, because it only continues because it's staying in the shadows, staying in the darkness. So I, I gave you another scenario. Yeah, that's fantastic, I love it. Tell us about um, how you would explain for people the shift from the Piscean age into the Aquarian age. What, what exactly that, means and what is the implication due to it excuse me mm -hmm. yes i want to i i want to just to clarify what i'm saying there i'm just going back to my last point 
I know that every woman will have seen something going on that was not always, was in the shadows. And it's often hard because you don't feel strong enough or courageous enough to say something. And sometimes it's just in the seeing of it. And even saying, I know what you're doing is the courage, my friends. So I'm saying that it's, I believe that I've, I've worked with so many women who have had the courage to say, I won't let this abuse carry on anymore in our family. And everybody else has turned their back on this person, but the abuse stopped because they had the courage to say something. So sometimes it is the women who say this relationship isn't working, this job isn't working, this is not the way we are meant to go. And it takes a lot of courage. So I'm really honoring everybody who's had the courage ever to stand up against the tribe who all want to be blind to what's going on elsewhere. So I wanted to add that in. And for those though, that can't find the courage due to the fact that they start the fear tape of going, well, how am I gonna support myself? And what if this, you know, what if I lose my family? Idea, you know, sometimes it's just the acknowledgement inside yourself. I see what is happening. And this brings us on, I will come back to the Piscean the Aquarian age, but remember we are all surrounded and, and helped by guides and spirits. Mm -hmm. And we often forget that amount, whether you call them angels or you call them, call them star beings or you call them guides, they're all somewhat the same, but what everybody has guides. It, it, maybe we need a better word. We all have cheerleaders. We all have friends. We all have a star family, a soul family. And sometimes all I will do is pass the message to my soul family and say, I see what's, what's happening. Please help us. So sometimes you don't have to ver verbalize it, but having the courage to say this is not what I want to have as my legacy for the future. In other words, if I've got children, what is the legacy I want to pass on to my children? And it doesn't have to be, I'm going to fight everybody. Just in being able to say, I want the very best for my children, my grandchildren. Therefore, help me guides, help me star people to actually bring into the light those things that are harming my future or harming the future of my children. So if your self-love isn't strong enough to do it for yourself, do it for someone that you love. I think it's children. everything is, yes. I mean, sometimes we, for instance, it, like this lady I'm thinking about, she had been abused as a child and she started to see it happening in her children and she could see it was just going to continue. So in some ways, she had already gone past the part that it could hurt her. It already hurt her, but mm -hmm. she did not want it for the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where women especially have courage. We say that a woman is much, you know, it's said that a woman is much more uh, determined when she's doing it for her children, her grandchildren. And he, I don't have children, but I will fight for anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. that's to me is my energy, which is, Everybody should know that this power of women to protect and to love is there for them. And it doesn't go away. You know, I'm like a mother bear if I see someone getting hurt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, wherever, you, that's within every woman and, and men, but women do it in a, in a way that says, stop. Yeah. You know, and that's more powerful when women speak from their shark, their sacral chakra, from, from bringing that energy up from the earth and they go, stop. Mm -hmm. It will stop, but we haven't got enough women at the moment who are willing to do that. And yes, because happening, you know? most of us are in our throat chakra, right? Exactly. And the energy is exactly. coming from up here yeah. rather than down here. So in your books and on your website and all your a lot of your work helps really teach women how to get down into the earth energy and pull the energy up. That's right. Uh, so through the sacral and rising up the spine which That's is, right. I think, wonderful so, because a lot of the patriarchal things are like the spirit is up above exactly. and pulling it down, but the feminine is pulling it from the earth up into the yes. body. Did I get that right? Oh, beautifully <laughs> said, beautifully <laughs> said. So just, you know, I, I'll just say, imagining that we have magnets on the soles of our feet and that there's a bigger magnet in Mother Earth and just allowing ourselves to be pulled into Mother Earth, which can be 
challenging if you've never had any feminine energy that supported you mm -hmm. and then allowing your, yourself to develop roots into mother earth and then allowing the beautiful moist soil of mother earth to surround and support your roots without suffocating that can be a huge step for any of us who have never felt safe on this earth and then you can go to the end of a longest root which is the root chakra and then you can draw this power this creative power that exists within Mother Earth eternally up through your roots, up through your legs, into your body. So that when you do that, especially as a woman, you bring that into your empty womb. And so you're speaking from the sacral chakra. Now, if you're a man, you're going to speak from your sacral chakra, which is, relates to your prostate. But what you're doing is if you, you know, I'll just give you my example. If I go, stop, stop for my throat, you know, stop doing that, stop doing that. Nobody listens to me. But if I, if I root myself and then bring that energy up and I say from my sacral chakra, stop now, I'm heard. So for women especially, be careful that when you want something to change, don't speak from up here because nobody will listen to you and nobody will take any note of you. And we hear so many women now speaking from up here and you know that that is a powerless place. So yeah. true, so true. And, and we, and and we so see, that's, that's the difference. Yeah. And just, you know, even if you're watching someone on television or YouTube, you know, watch, where are they speaking from? Do they speak from their throat chakra and then they're up here and they're just monotonal and it doesn't actually having any emotion in it? Or are they speaking from their own sense of power? And if they're speaking from their sacral chakra, it means they've done their own work. They face their own demons. But when they have to speak up here, they're not willing to do it. So that's the difference. I love it. I have to ask you, I know we're going to get to that other point, but what would you say in your experience is the, the bottom line of the relationship for us with our own mothers? Like, how does that affect us and our lives and what happens and how we relate to our feminine? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in my belief system, we choose our mothers, we choose our family, we choose our way, when we're going to be born, where we're going to be born, what time we're going to be born. All of that is chosen. Now, none of us are back. We're all back with the old crowd. Okay. And that's the way I like to look at it, <laughs> is that we made a choice before we came here and we all went, okay, who's going to be the mother? Who's going to be... And they said, oh, I don't want to be the mother. Oh, but you do it so well. <laughs> so we all, we all came back again. And you may not be back with the same mother. Maybe you were the mother last time. It doesn't matter. But that's, that's an idea that you did have some relationship to this person. And for women especially, because we lie in the womb of our mother for nine months, our eggs are all those eggs, that million eggs, are all marinated in our mother's emotional soup. And her eggs were marinated in her mother's soup, et cetera, et cetera. Men make their sperm when they're ready, i.e. when they go through puberty. So it's different for a man. So as women, we have to do ancestral healing at least three generations back, if not seven generations back. And so we can't separate from our mothers in that way. We, we are in, we're already marinated. We've already received oh. their energy. Now, part of the issue is that our mothers supply are, are the intermediaries between, you could say, our spirit mother and earth mother. And the real role of a mother is to feed the child, both with safety and confidence and food, but to wean them off the breast by the age of five. And that's what a mother should be able to do is to say, now I'm putting you onto Mother Earth. This is where who's going to supply you with nurturing and support. And that was my role is to act as that, that intermediary. But for a lot of people, they don't have that full support and they aren't feeling confident by five years or maybe they were thrown off the breast too quickly. And so often there is a feeling of, if this is how my mother treated me, this is how Mother Earth will treat me. Mm. So our, dis, our disconnect from Mother Earth isn't just what the patriarchy did, which was to look up in the sky, don't look down here. But many people don't trust their mother, their physical mother, therefore they don't trust Mother Earth. Oh boy. What, so, about, what about yeah. someone who's adopted? 
Um, again, various reasons. Um, I will say my husband was adopted, but he doesn't see that as a bad thing because <laughs> he, he got away from the mother who he didn't want to be with, you know? Mm. So you can sometimes, uh, you know, we must never just because they're adopted, it must be this one way. You know, many adopted people also have Aquarian energy. So what I'm saying there is if you have any Aquarian energy in your astrology, often you don't want to be here. You didn't want to be here in the first place. And you certainly don't want to be bound by other people's emotional demands or dogmas. So many people who have Aquarian energy often find themselves in in adoptive situations or non-committed relationships. That's fascinating. I can't even believe it because, you know, I'm Aquarius. Oh, I forgot that, Amy. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's almost like we set ourselves up to be detached from our family. <laughs> so it's like, thank God mother wasn't there, you know, and someone would say to me, I had an absent mother and an absent father. And I go, but you're Aquarian. Of course you did. <laughs> well, so, but why would you do that intentionally? Because Aquarians have a big problem with, they believe, I mean, there are various things, <coughs> but I'll just stay with the Aquarian. Um, it, they believe that if they fully embody being on this earth, they will not know their way home. And so they have very strong spiritual connections and they believe that they fully love being on this earth. They may not know their way home. So how do we fix that? Help. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's oh, Aquarian. no. We have to do all the opposite things, which is oh, oh. literally sometimes we have to cut off our spiritual connection and come fully onto earth in order to then create a vessel for all that wonderful wisdom of the Aquarian to come into. Wait, cut off the spiritual connection. What sometimes does that we mean? have to stop saying, stop meditating, stop, you know, Aquarians don't need to meditate anyway, but I've got my moon in Aquarius. Sometimes we have to say, I don't believe in anything. All I know is true is being here on this earth. Wow. Now, I did that, my friend, and my guides didn't disappear. I didn't, but I wasn't trying to hold on to some belief that kept me connected to just the spirit world. Wow. I had to literally say, okay, this is my food. This is, you know, do food. Wow. Dancey things. And <laughs> right now, I think my headphones just blew off my face. <laughs> I'm like, that was, uh, you're blowing my mind with this. This is, I've never heard this before. And it's pretty yeah. powerful. I have goosebumps. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of, and I will say that there are other people. Um, if I'm, if you have your astrology, if anybody has their astrology, the Pluto in Virgo group, which were kind of born during the 60s, early 70s, late 50s. They will believe that, you know, I, the world is in a bad place. I'll come down and fix it. Then I can go home again. You know? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and they call them, you know, lovely. They call themselves light workers because, of course, they've come from the light. They're nothing to do with this shitty world we're living in, excuse me. But, that, you mm -hmm. know, it's like, actually, you're part of this. You have to embody it mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than just coming to fix something. So, And then there's another group of beings who may have a lot of Scorpio energy who, who feel everything. They feel the pain of the world. Mm. So they're telling me, why would I want to come onto this earth when it's so painful? And, you know, people aren't going to understand me anyway. That's the Aquarian thing. Nobody understood me anyway. So when I'm looking at a chart, I see all the reasons why people don't want to come fully onto this earth. And therefore, they often pick a mother who represents what they already believe about being on planet earth. Who represents what they already believe. Yeah. Meaning, uh, uh, so let's say a very emotional mother or an abused mother or abusive mother, they're uh, the ones who already pick up on all the emotions of their mother and say, wow, it was so overwhelming to be in her womb even because she had so many, much, right. she had um, miscarriages, death, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. talking about the Scorpio other people. They're like, wow, it was all so painful to be in her. And then it was a painful birth and it was a difficult birth. I nearly died. You know, and then my mother was, you know, emotionally unabated, whatever. You know, they basically that's then how they project their image they project onto being on Earth and being here on the planet. Okay, but I still not clear why a soul would do that purposely. Um, well, mainly because it sounds horrible. <laughs> well, you know, we would like to think that every soul chose a path that would help them. And I believe every soul mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we don't leave the astral world enough when we pass over. So we literally recreate a world that is exactly as we've just left it. 
I see. To finish unfinished business, maybe. Well, we may we may even just be addicted to it, and that's the problem. Um, so, if I kind of say when we leave, you know, when we die, we should get ourselves free of the what we call the astral world, the emotional world, or even the mental body world. But we often just kind of cycle back in again, carrying the same emotional addiction. Wow. Because and you, you might say, why would anybody do that? I mean, that's what you are asking me. But what I'm saying there is. I might say, why is this woman or man staying in this relationship that's so bad? Mm -hmm. You know, and we can come up with, well, they're codependent, they're this or that, but there's there's almost an addiction to this. Mm -hmm. Now, I could say, um, you know, not taking it in. Uh, I have Mars in Capricorn, so I'm I'm very much about order and working and martyrdom and rich, you know, responsibility. And it's almost like, where am I obsessed that this is the belief system that I must live by? So wow. it's not just the emotion, it's almost, but who am I when I'm not doing that? This has to be me. So sometimes, you know, the biggest challenges I'm always having with people is, is having the courage to change, as you said. And I might say, you don't have to live this way, Amy. And you'll say, yes, I do, Christine. This is how it is, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'll say, no, that's only in our belief system. So we've developed words like karma, or this is what I'm here to learn. Mm. Or I'm doing it for healing my ancestors. But all of that is just belief systems. Or it's genetic. Well, it, oh, it's genetic. I, I hear that a lot. Anything else. We yeah. have all these should, must, oughts. You know, this is the code I have to live by. And none of it's true. It's just it, that it is our belief systems that give us security. Because if I said, Amy, that's not true you or I might say, oh my goodness, well, what is true? That Exactly. You have to question everything. We're mm -hmm. scared of the mystery that I've been talking about that we enter on that second day of our period or say, what entering mystery is what we've been in, in lockdown or in cocooning is, mm -hmm. oh my God, who am I if I'm not what I thought I was? What is the world like if it's not? So if I say, actually, your mum wasn't like that, you'll go, well, who, what, you know, we, we hold on to stories in order to mm. identify ourselves. And that's what needs to die. So entering the mystery ultimately is really entering the feminine. Yes. Yeah, whether, we're ma whether we're male or female absolutely. or identify, it's just whatever gender person yes. goes into the mystery is, is accessing your feminine. You've got it. And you know, that's if again, if I look at all the indigenous stories of creation, they all start in the beginning was not the word, but in the beginning was the no thing ah. and the sea. And so I call it the ocean of possibilities. Other people call it, you know, the great sea. That's why Aphrodite coming out the sea, being born from the sea was so significant mm -hmm. because the goddesses were born out of the waters and the waters were seen to cover the earth, you know? So that in the beginning was this watery energy. And that's why, you know, everything comes, we go back into the water, we go back into this ocean of possibilities. And we often call it nothingness. In other words, there's nothing that's concrete or, or manifest, it's possibilities are available to us. That's what we go into, as you say, in that mystery is not, the mystery is, wow, look at the possibilities available to me. It's kind of like nothing is everything. Like exactly. it's, it's nothing, therefore it can be everything. Exactly. It's not, so not, it's no, not one, no one thing. It's yeah. just full of, of no, nothing yet as yet defined. And as right. soon as you focus on something, it becomes it. A so thing. that's when yeah. we focus on a belief and we refuse to say, no, stop telling me it's not real. And I say, well, it's one reality. But actually, if you look over here, there's another reality. Which one do you want? You, you know? see, I feel like so many of us get stuck in such tunnel vision. How can we access our imagination? Why have why have we as a culture lost our whole imagine imaginatory abilities? I, I <laughs> it, it really is, you know, we've lost that childlike innocence. Yes. And I could jump around here, but I mean I worked a lot with children who had had past life memories and they were actually recorded. We knew they were true, but we lose that from about the age of eight because we have to kind of get fermented in something. And a child they would tell me a story and then they'd go off to play. They weren't bothered. There's like, here's one story, here's another story. And now I'm in this story. Mm -hmm. And it's that multidimensional appearance. And 
I use the analogy you've probably heard of, you know, the men who are describing the elephant. One says it's got a big trunk, oh, one yeah. says it's got a big leg, and the one under the tail says life is, you know, shit, yeah. you know. And even if you try to persuade that person to move into, you know, just take one step away from the tail and look at the trunk, they would say, no, no, I have to stay here. It's my karma. It's my mm. And so what I've worked with the courage to change is how hard it is for us to change. Take that one step. And as you said, use that imagination. And the, the, something I learned from Tony Robbins, he says is, if the pain of change is greater than the pain of staying where you are, you will not change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to make, you know, nobody, why would anybody go towards something that's more painful? And many people see change as more painful. So you have to make the, the change more pleasurable than where you are. Mm -hmm. So that's when imagination comes in. And we you don't have to say, how can I say, um, if I walk along the road and I just go, I am embodying joyfulness. And I really embody it, not just think it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, this is a joyful Christine. Mm -hmm. The more I do that, the more I then start to bring about the change I want in the world. Mm -hmm. And so, so the embody. embodiment of change is not, I don't necessarily go along with affirmations because they don't work. What works is be, feel it in your body. Wear clothes that represent who you want to be. I that's totally that. agree. I think that's so well said. You have to embody it because that's yes. the, you know, the law of attraction and all the stuff. Affirmations are nothing. If there's no emotional charge, yes. the emotions, what gives it the charge, which gives it the magnetic quality. Yeah. You're, it gives it the true projection that the outside world can perceive is coming yes. from you. Otherwise, it's just empty words. And, and you can do it easily. You know, you could just literally, if I go to the shops, and um, I might walk along and I'm, you know, I go, okay, I'll be miserable. Guess what? Everybody around me is miserable. Mm. And then if I just change and I go, actually, I'm going to be happy. Everybody says hello to me. Yeah. And it literally is that we change the world around us by, as you say, mm -hmm. the, what's the magnetic field we're putting out into the world? Right on, right on. All right. Well, I know we're getting up to time and my gosh, I could talk to you for days and days, but let's just quickly, if you don't mind, circle back on, I, I really would love for you to share with our audience uh, your synopsis of what's happening right now with all this 2020, 2021, COVID, what's happening with the world, the shift from the Piscean to the Aquarian and what this is all about and how we can make sense of it. So thank you. And uh, just to say, we're not yet in the Aquarian age. And I, that's, I'm reading a lot of people say we are. What we're actually doing is starting to draw that energy. Mm -hmm. uh, the actual concept of Aquarian age is looking at the sun. What's the planets, excuse me, what's the stars behind the sun on the 21st of March? And it's still Pisces, the constellation of Pisces. Mm. But <laughs> I'm just putting that in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Piscean age started about 2000 years ago. And it was very much about one fish being at the front or the other fish following. So we've had 2000 years of leaders, gurus, teachers, messiahs. And it should have been the sacred marriage of opposites, which meant I see in you what I see in me. I do unto you as I do unto me. But we haven't done that. We've seen anybody who is different from us and we've gone to war against them. So this whole, I, you know, rising up, of what is racism, what is, is coming from this polarization we've achieved. Because we now have intolerance to anybody's intolerance. I mean, we're just going around in circles here. So what we want to see is the end of this polarization, whether it's between two teams, masculine, feminine, there's a third quality. So it's like this and this and this. And this brings the Aquarian energy, which is we all are self-responsible. We all are conscious. There is no hierarchical figure. We sit in a circle and we all offer our most responsive energies, but we also are accountable for what we do. And we are a long way from that. We want someone else to tell us what to do and then we blame them when it goes wrong. So this whole accountability is coming, you know, this is where we're moving to. And we've got Jupiter and Saturn have just gone into Aquarius. So we're going to see far less centralized governments, more community governments. 
And I think I'm seeing it in my own small community. What do we need to do for our children, our health care, not generalized? Less rules coming out from the central government, more about what's right for our, our community. But we're also saying is we need to stop looking at for a leader that's going to tell us what to do or a messiah who's going to come. We need to say, what is the leader in me? What do I want to bring forward? And this will be coming more and more into these next few years. For America, Pluto is coming up to what we call a Pluto return in about 22, 23. And that's going to be bringing up to the surface all the issues about constitution and legalization because that was, Pluto takes 250 years to go around. It's coming back to the place where it was at the time of the birth of America. So this will be quite significant. So things aren't gonna settle, my dear friends. I'm sorry to say, we're going to see much more change, sometimes revolutionary change coming up, especially next year. Mm -hmm. But it's not from a place of, uh, it doesn't have to be a war. That would almost be a sight. We don't need that. We need to start to say, is this, does this nurture my next seven generations? Mm -hmm. Is this coming into my own power? What am I willing to contribute rather than just put my hands over my eyes and hope it will go away? This is a time for being honest with ourselves. And we've all had the chance to, to look and saying, what does it actually feel to be empowered within me rather than be empowered by by my job I do. Mm -hmm. So the shift that's taking place is that there will be a shift in how we value ourselves because we are seeing the onset of AI in a much bigger way than we will ever see. And this isn't gonna go away. In other words, jobs are gonna disappear that a, a robot can do. And unfortunately COVID is, a, you know, part of the COVID pandemic was to allow AI to come in more and more. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying to all of us, Look at what does it mean to be human? What, what jobs do you do? What is it that makes you human that a robot can't do? And it is about our creativity, but it's also about our compassion, as our inspiration, our spontaneity. Intuition. You know, and it's how we treat our elderly, which is appalling, or how we treat anybody. A robot cannot take over the role of someone giving someone a hug or giving someone a kiss. So I feel that we're moving, we've been told we mustn't do all of this, but once we start to be told what to do and act more like robots, we're losing our humanity. And what we need to do is to bring that humanity in and saying, I'm doing this because I care about our people, not from fear, but from love. And I see love and intuition really coming in over the next few years. Beautiful. Wow, Dr. Christine Page, is there uh, anything else you would like to share with our audience? We've touched on so many things and there's so much more I even want to get into, but I'm concerned where I just want to be respectful of your time. So is there anything else you'd like to share before you tell us how we can find you and people can well, thank get you. in touch thank with you? Thank you, Amy, for all the work you're doing and the beautiful way you're bringing forward this, these thank ideas you. and your own wisdom and your own love. I know that's, that's coming over very strongly today. Oh, thank you. Um, as I would say is that one of the things that is important, you know, I talked about being dead inside and then I yeah. spoke about what I needed to find. In each of us is our core values, our core energy that gets us out of bed in the morning or lights our fire. For me, it's curiosity, it's connection, it's feeling joy. So they're not things that I need someone else to do for me. Mm -hmm. It's I, I, you know, I love caring for people, but it's that's something I need other people. I want every one of us to, to tap in and say, what are the three qualities that make me feel alive? Because once we tap into those, those are the things that will see you through for the rest of your life. And they are, robots can't have them. They're things that are unique to us. So find your uniqueness. And then once you have those, you magnetically express those into the world and you will naturally bring into your life those things that resonate with the things that bring you joy. Brilliant. So I will just say that thank you for everybody who's listening, watching, and it's been a pleasure. Uh, you can find me, as uh, Amy has said, on my 
my own podcast, Heartspeak Podcast, which is on all the different platforms. And also come to my website and go onto my mailing list so you can hear what I'm up to, christinepage.com. I'm also on Instagram, et cetera, and Facebook. And I am moving my own line of work is one is I on Insight Timer. I have created a 30 day course called The Magic of Mother Nature. So it's there and available for you through Insight Timer. And I'm also moving my work also to bring more connection to the fact that we are nature. So I'm also doing uh, an online course called Embodying Mother Nature, and literally, we are nature. So uh, do join me because I think it is the way through is to recognize our connection to Mother Earth, to the skies, the cosmos, and to our beautiful bodies that are there for us. So uh, embracing Mother Nature course, is that set, uh, starting at a certain date or is that an ongoing? Yes, uh, we're, if we're starting in January. Okay. And I should say it's not so much a course, it's going to be three different seminars and then I'll have a break and three more. But we're going to be going into understanding ourselves in the mineral kingdom, the planetary kingdom, the, the plant kingdoms. It's attaching into our portals around the world, sacred sites. So it's all oh. the things I've also enjoyed doing. But I believe that the planet here is beautifully set up for us to expand our consciousness and become awakened to who we truly are. Right on. That's great. So that's January 2021 for everyone listening that course. You. you can find uh, Dr. Christine Page on her website, which is uh, christinepage.com. And all her social media is the same. How convenient for us to remember. And her wonderful podcast where you can hear her depth of wisdom and her beautiful methodical voice that I know we're all just totally enamored with on Heart Speak podcast, Heart Speak, which is, I love that name. So thank you so much, Christine, for being on Awakening Aphrodite with me and all of our listening audience. This has thank been you, Amy. It's been my great pleasure. Oh, truly. So thank you everyone for listening. I really hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, I know you learned a lot like I did. And um, please check out Christine's uh website or podcast or courses and all that and if you enjoyed the show please let me know by rating it five stars and i'd be ever so grateful if you would write a quick review okay everybody until next time i already can't wait to be with you again and thanks a lot everyone bye-bye <laughs>